call the meeting to order for the Longmont Housing Authority Advisory Board on April 19th. Erica, can you uh, do a roll call, please? Definitely. So we have um, Cameron Grant. Here. Jean Christopher. Here. Arlene Zortman. Here. Lauren Sally. Here. And Tom DeLeaf. Here. And then staff present, we have uh, Harold Dominguez. Here. Lisa Gallimer. Here. And Michelle Wake. Here. All right, moving along. Uh, item number two, approval of the minutes for March 15th, 2022 meeting. Do we have any changes or do I have a motion? I don't see any movement changes. I'll make it All right, a second. Second. Okay. All right, so we have a motion by uh, Jean and a second by Lauren to approve the minutes. Um, let's vote. Uh, ayes? Aye. 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 Nays? Mm -hmm. All right. My only comment is they're extremely detailed. Yeah, yeah. And they're so long. That's okay. And that's there's great. a lot more detail than you were seeing in the yeah. minutes. Like All right, approval of the minutes pass. <clears throat> Next, public invited to be heard. Have anybody from the public? We don't have anybody. Since I've been on has other than last time, has there been much public to be heard on any of the meetings prior to the prior to COVID? Yeah. There would be every once in a while people yeah. that wanted to speak. Yeah. Okay. In, in person meetings. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we had a period of time where we had people that would attend mm -hmm. and just listen, but not necessarily speak. Yeah. 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 So it was a little more common, but not Lots maybe five minutes of public comment at the most. Well, we had a three-minute limit on everybody, too. Yeah, although the last time I remember having a meeting here, we had a lot of public comment. Hmm. We met down in the open area, yeah, the open and everybody area. was there, yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah. it was very involved. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. that prior to being an advisory capacity? Yes, yeah. that was the actual was housing board. authority. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it probably depends on where you're meeting, too. Mm -hmm. That's really more open down there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do the um, notices get posted at all the properties? Here, I did not get posted here because Chris did go home sick yesterday. So you do a day mm -hmm. ahead of time, is that? Yeah. So all the properties do get posted besides this one. Okay. Yeah, we had one at the last um, on the board. We had one person show up and listen. And then we had a reporter, and that's all we had, so mm -hmm. I think it's kind of hit or miss these days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's posted with the agenda, right? The, the posting? Yeah. The okay. okay, let's move on to item number four, update on community engagement process. There isn't really an update other than to say I'm very behind. <laughs> um, my apologies, this is for Cameron, and that's for you or me. Um, so... These are the dots you're going to be using. So, as you meet with folks, um, um, so we had had a schedule for the end of March, and then um, I had some things come up and couldn't pull the end of March together. So, we will get new schedules um, and get these posted um, for when Cameron and Lauren and Arlene are available at the properties. So, I have new ones we can fill in um, and we'll follow up. I would say that a um, couple of things have come up recently that are going to influence at the various properties. So um, at Spring Creek, there is a real interest in activity funds. And so um, there are about tw there's about $2,500 at Spring Creek uh, for activity and resident services. And so um, folks are really interested in having an influence on what priorities, what the, how those funds, mm -hmm. uh, what would get selected. Mm -hmm. So Kendra actually came and to a copy or to a separate meeting and talked about the, the budget process there. So Spring Creek is that. Um, the Lodge and Hearthstone have some real strong interest in a garden. So that's emerged and they're looking for that as an activity. And then the topic of um, significance has been the parking permit piece and so I think if we had engaged in these conversations two weeks ago 
that would have been all we three weeks ago that would have been all we heard oh, okay. so um i i think at this point with that moved on some that will it be able to cover broader topics so not an excuse for me being behind by any means but i think um the activity pieces as covid and has lightened up and things are happening i think the activity piece is going to be really key and then i think moving moving through um, there also has been some recent security kinds of things emerge, and so you may hear some stuff around that. Um, and so I don't know, Lisa, if there's anything else relative to conversation-wise, but it's been parking, gardens, activities, and... And I think evictions is a big one at some of them as we're moving forward on... Understanding the process. The process and why it's taken so long and why now we're just doing something or why even now it's taking long being closed. Yeah. So I think you may hear some things different than what we heard when we did the initial one-on-one -on -one interviews. So in your packet, you have a place to take notes and then um, as those things emerge. So really, it's about getting the four of us, plus Veronica Garcia is going to do two in Spanish uh, follow-ups, one at um, Spring Creek and um, one at the Lodge, I think she's going to do two. So we'll get those going. And then any, Karen Roney was going to do the conversations here. I don't know how she was going to fit that in the last week of March. But anyway, so I'll be doing the, the conversations here. Um, and so I think we'll, we're just about getting those schedules. And the property managers are all on board. They know it's coming and they know their office doors are going to have the sign-up sheets. They'll have extra dots so people can vote um, if they don't want to have a conversation. So... Once we get the schedules going again for the next couple weeks, I think three weeks or so, I think we'll be we'll be back on track. So where are the boards going to be? Are they going to be right in on the, be on the floor, office on the ring? On okay. the office doors. Okay. So yep, they'll be on the office doors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, and Kat and Krista and um, they're all on board for Andrea for helping make those happen. So getting people and there'll be pens. People can sign up even without them being there. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of where we're at. But I do think it's important to kind of have a feel for what the conversations mm -hmm. are. <laughs> What's happening um, in the properties right now. So um, we're moving forward on some things um, that still could color the conversations that you hear. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, other thoughts? Am I missing any big topics that might come up? Because again, I really don't want anybody blindsided by that. Security hit or miss will be, we have different issues at <clears throat> different properties. So, um, and, sorry, I'm having allergy issues, I'm not asleep. <clears throat> um, so at um, Spring Creek and Fall River, you're probably going to hear a lot about catalytic converters and mm -hmm. issues there. Um, just to give you a sense of catalytic converter issues, over the weekend we had somebody jump the fence at our park facility and took out about six of them. Yeah. And um, we had like four more that they tried to take out. So it's just, a, it's an issue all over the place. Um, and um, so you'll hear that there. Lisa may cover this in part of her property report. Um, we, we had one, uh, was it at the lodge? We, we had a break in. Uh, we were able to contact the police department. They were able to contact the police department. Actually, a pretty decent video. We were able to track it in through the security system. And so the, the police department stood in through there. And then, what was it? We had another similar issue at the village place. Um, the thing is, I think some of the things we put in security-wise are actually starting to show their value, and um, and so we're going to be working. We're going to be working on that one. So that's kind of the security update. Um, parking, uh, just to kind of give you a heads up on that one. Um, it, it's it's an interesting. We're seeing some really interesting things in parking right now. Um, parking is is an issue dependent on where you are. It's a different driver for each one of the issues. So, for example, there's a lot of parking spaces here. Um, the, the need for the parking permit here is as much for security as it is anything else. Um, 
and, and really monitoring who's in the parking lot, who's not in the parking lot because of um, different activities that occur here. Um, Village Place obviously is a different parking pressure uh, in terms of the downtown impact. Um, and then what's interesting to me, I was telling them, um, it's been interesting to, to drive by Aspen Meadows and drive by Spring Creek and Fall River and see the parking lots aren't full cool now. And so that's a piece of what we we're trying to do. I think, you know, we've all said we probably could have done better rolling it out um, and dealing with some of the, the issues because we still have some confusion and we're still engaging and trying to fine tune the program. But it's been really interesting for me to see who actually should be parking there and who shouldn't be parking there as we're driving around. And, um, I was surprised, Gene, about how empty the Aspen Meadow parking lot was once we started doing it. And so uh, we got some more work to do, obviously, and we can continue improving the program, but you will hear that. And we have made some adjustments to folks and given rent credits when we felt there was um, a tow that wasn't appropriate, so we're still working through it. But they've done a really good job communicating with the neighborhoods on, or the neighbors the neighborhoods on, on these issues. But more to come, but it's interesting to see what we're seeing. Um. I would say the, the most uh, powerful statement really has been to remind the residents that this was something they asked for is to get a handle on mm -hmm. um, people inappropriately parking. <clears throat> yeah. So the rollout, again, may not have been as ideal, but it was something we were trying to respond to a problem. Well, the, the rollout was considered overkill. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, but, but now we're, you know, we're, we're tweaking it, it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, yeah. It was in response to broader, bigger mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. for sure, so. Yeah, yeah it's interesting in, in our neighborhood. Um, I was I started wondering how many of the neighbors are ended up parking in those lots yeah. because it's different. Yeah. It's just like, wow. So, so did you guys let the HOAs know <clears throat> up there that this they don't park in there? We posted the signs, and so you know, mm -hmm. the signs are really the key. Yeah. Mm. Do you have a company doing parking management? Or do you just have a tow company? Just a tow company. Okay. So the places that were broken into, how did they get in? Did they somebody let them in, or one was codes at the lodge? They used um, a vendor code to get into the building, and then the other one, a resident let him in, but she was probably about half the size of the guy. Mm -hmm. And so we're having um, Sarah Arnie with the police department is actually going to do their coffee and conversations this week to kind of go over what you should do if you don't want to address it, but, you know, go call 911 from your apartment and mm -hmm. how to handle the situation. Mm -hmm. So We're checking on the call boxes, making sure the names and apartment that it's all as secure as possible from the call boxes, so mm -hmm. not first and last names. And So that's something that might come up because we are going to just um, – at the lodge, we are going to do away with the codes. We're doing their coffee and conversations tomorrow, and we're going to do some education around why they don't need a code because they can still call with their phone or they have their key fob to get in. They have two different ways to get in, and even if they don't have that, they can have a buddy in the building that they can use on the call box to let them in. So we're going to phase that out probably over two to three weeks. We're not going to do it immediately, but give them time to make arrangements or if they do need an additional fob as a reasonable accommodation to have that person fill out an application and go through a background check before we hand out a fob to a stranger. So then vendors won't be able to get in, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah the call boxes are a problem. Yeah. yeah. Interesting because we were going to have one at the smoke and we thought we'd be eat it out and then it disappeared. And we're like, oh great, more stuff to manage. Mm -hmm. So that, that'll be interesting. I'll, I'll let our, our team know, our operations team know that you guys are having issues with because that's a big problem. And then the Amazon with package deliveries and they wanted codes. and So we went to the Amazon device again. I worked it through with Amazon to get the device installed again at a couple other properties so that they don't have to have a code. They don't have to call. They can. They have to be in the foyer and scan right there the package and then it will notify once they're in the vestibule that they're there to open the door. Okay. And there is actually going to be a, a hub, a package hub at the spoke 
um, in the breezeway. So, oh, nice. I, and it'll be available I think, for most people. Um, it's good to know. I mean, we're going to have our residents on there, but I don't know if it's going to be available to everybody. Mm -hmm. But um, if it is, I'll let you know because then that's something maybe your residents can use that. For yeah, I think they would love that. So, yeah. Because Amazon likes to leave them in the courtyard. <laughs> and just, was, was it just one unit broken into? Or? It was not a unit, it was the office, the office area. They ripped the red box off, um, took coffee pots, vacuums. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so yes, no rent. Pots. Yeah, they took coffee pots out of the common area, wow. the vacuum, um, cleaning supplies. So we believe you might have had a car to be loading up all this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Random things. Yeah. yeah. I tried to take the TV, but it was bolted down. So. <laughs> <laughs> so those things may come up in your conversations, <laughs> and so we're uh, we're working on identifying what are systems issues and what are particular property issues. But I think security has always been a topic across all the properties. But it might just look unique depending on where you are. And then Lisa had uh, David Kennedy and um, Sarah Arney, the crime-free police officers, at the last at a Spring Creek Coffee and Conversation, and at Fall River, mm -hmm. and uh, was really well received. That was a, a good, a good conversation with residents to bring up specific issues. So that was very helpful. And the fire department was coming up. Then. Yes, the fire department starts Thursday at Wednesday at the lodge, and then over the next two months they're doing. A coffee and conversation is at each property. Great. Thank you. All right. So I'll just get with you guys and get your schedules and we'll go from there. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, welcome. Thanks, guys, for doing this. Uh, moving on to number five organizational updates. A is a LHA advisory board role, purpose, and bylaws update. Okay, so I'll jump in here this item. So um, the, the purpose of role. Piece was brought forward at your request, um, Arlene. This was um, from your original email where this stemmed, where we're talking about um, the bylaws review, anyways, which we're doing, and then how does the LHA advisory board's role fit in when it comes to um, serving as an advisory body for the board of commissioners compared to resident issues. Um, this is really just more of an open up for your conversation. I will say the bylaws, um, we have the bylaws edit to add the vice chair. That we're going to post for seven days ahead of the May 3rd board meeting. So if there's any other uh, changes that you all want to make, that's what we can fit in before we go ahead and post that. Opening this one up for anything, Arlene, about your concerns about the advisory board? Or? Well, I guess, and, and I have not, I've only been on here a short time. So I just think back to sometimes when Cameron brought up after the switch came, um, you know, when it went to the council, kind of what is, is our role? And we're sort of trying to find out what our role is. And um, based on the one coffee and conversation, one of the coffee and conversations I attended where the person got, um, you know, said, well, what is the advisory board for and what do we need them for if they're not going to, um, you know, which she didn't say help us. But, so I guess that kind of triggered it again. And I know Cameron at the last meeting, you did suggest something to be put in here, but in all honesty, I didn't write it down, so I don't. I've, I've long since forgotten that. But, uh, yeah. I, I think that's when we were talking about quality of mm -hmm. life for the residents. Because mm -hmm. um, that's the one thing that got the OHA board into big trouble mm -hmm. uh, in 2017 because we ignored it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I think it's, it's only. Um, uh, appropriate for the advisory board since um, we have we have the ability and um, we are more concerned about communication between residents and staff and board and what have you um, that this board be concerned about the quality of life that 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 we're providing to the residents 
the other side of that, um, <clears throat> in case you haven't noticed, it's going to be residents' opinion that drive the image that the Longmont Housing Authority has. It's not whether or not you get an award for the perfect building. It's going to be what the news is in town because all of our residents are connected locally. So for us, if we're, you know, granted we need to advise the advisory board, but um, we also have an obligation to look out for the residents. The board cannot get involved in day-to-day -day management. The, the, the Housing Authority Board cannot. That's part of their thing. And, and if we don't need to necessarily get involved in day-to-day -day management, but we need to let management know when, hey, this didn't work. You know, um, and I'm sure that management gets pounded by <coughs> residents who will quickly tell them that it didn't work. However, uh, that doesn't relieve us from the responsibility because quality of life and, and the manner in which we manage has a huge impact and it lasts for a long time. You know, it's taken, it's been, what, four years since the sweets issue and it's still a sore spot. It's still a sore spot. So that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. And you had mentioned that um, we, we do have that opportunity here mm -hmm. to be uh, um, a little more in touch with what's going on. And I remember in the last meeting, there was a lot about the chain of command conversation of bringing mm -hmm. issues up and, um, you know, whether or not we can be sort of an intermediary if someone feels they're, you know, they don't want to go to the property manager. There's, there's a lot of fear mm -hmm. in going in, in, in to, uh, for a resident, especially in affordable housing, you don't want to offend the landlord. And, um, and, you know, probably at most property, there's one person that will really speak out. But they're saying things that, whoops, you know, the quiet people didn't want to say, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it, and it, but, but we need to have that avenue. And if we're going to have chain of command, we need to have response from the chain of command. And that reinforces using it. But when, you know, when you don't get response, you quit using it, and and it, that has to be a part of, of what um, the housing authority offers is that response to an issue. Um, and I will compliment you totally, Lisa. That after that, I heard all about the 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 coffee and conversation I couldn't go to, but the letter you wrote after that, clarifying, was beautiful. It was. A clear and it, and I'm not the only person that said that they were like did you see that letter? and it was it was um, honoring the fact that you had taken suggestions and it it was beautiful and it, it's like that's the beautiful charm and it's those kind of little things just the little things make a big difference and um, so um, I on my soapbox. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Jean, do you think that under Article Seven, Section Three, that that captures the duty of the advisor board as you see it? It I, doesn't address that uh, uh, chain of command, but it does. Let me just remind everybody that we're using pathways of communication. Okay. So, chain of so, out, so the advisory yes. board could be a pathway of communication. Yeah. Because I've been kind of hit, hearing two different things. So, you know, pathway of communication, another outlet for them to voice their concerns. And then one thing I didn't see in here, too, was maybe a consideration of the quality of life yeah, uh, for our recommendations yeah. to the commissioners. Yeah. Like maybe a, it's so twofold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it's the pathway of communication kind of may facilitate the quality of life, but also. You know, um, it's the mindset of the staff. And, and as you get to know everybody, because I know it's it's gotten so much better since you've had time to get to know people in person. Um, it, it is, it is um, uh, becoming um, more considerate of the residents. 
whereas before it was literally coming the law requires this the law requires and it's like wait we're in this somewhere you know so it, it's it's easing up but yeah let's put quality of life in there and and the pathways beautiful now looking at, at section three language is really broad in this the, the, yeah, it is. The operative language is just that first sentence. Yeah, it is confusing. We will advise the board and matters yeah, concerning yeah. the authority. So we can do whatever we want to do, what we look into. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's helpful to have some guideposts to remind us. And that's what I think the next section is where it talks about um, policy matters pertaining to management of residential properties, investment mm -hmm. and development projects, mm -hmm. performance of the properties, review of budgets. Yeah. Um, renovations, community needs assessment regarding housing needs, and then the last one, which is, it's as close as anything to, to what we're talking about, not quite there, I don't think. Service so community connected by participating in resident engagement to ensure communication between resident staff and board. Um, so we're not bound by that. Those are things that they, we, sh we should do, but we could do more. But I'm wondering, do we want to add in some reference to say, um, uh, something like you know, just to address the needs, the, you know, the quality of life of the residents of the of housing authority yeah, properties. Yeah, because setting the policies and um, providing that communication kind of it, it covers watching for the quality of life, but I think. I, I would just like to see the words in there. I think that's a good idea, and I also think, I, I know why it's written like this, and I, mm -hmm. in many years as a paralegal, I understand the form of this document, but I would really like to see it more of like a bullet point, because when I read this as just a long, flowing list of things, it's really hard to find that context and compartmentalize the different roles. Like in one, we're advising on policy, on one, we're reviewing budget. And sometimes you read the first part and then you apply it to everything that follows. Right. And so I just think that ambiguity is confusing and it would help us formalize and, and remember what our roles are, what we can do. And I, I think in legal documents, the clearer you can be, the better. And clear is kind, is what I'm always reminded of from, um, oh, what's the lady that, she's like a, research person who does like informational or whatever speaking, I can't think of her name, she's really popular from Texas. Brene Brown. Yes, Brene Brown, thank you. Clear is kind. And so um, if we could make that section a little bit more clear to understand, I think it would be helpful. My wife has clearly told me I need to read more Brene Brown. <laughs> <laughs> I have the books, they always sit there and have aspirations of reading them. But who has time? That's why audiobooks are the best. Mm -hmm. So do we want to change it where we put bullet points in, or do we want to add in kind of a... We're just some framework. It doesn't necessarily framework. do bullet points, but just okay. call out the different sections, the different ideas, instead of having them all run in one long sentence separated by semicolons. So I was, I'm going to suggest that um, we probably do want to add something about quality of life. Mm -hmm. But I want to be careful because bylaws should be pretty general and kind of static. Mm -hmm. And then we can adopt the our action plan as to how we're going to implement these duties. And we can be much more specific and fluid about that without having to go back through this process to the board to update the bylaws. So I think it, I, I like the quality of life as, as maybe we could add piece. like in consideration of the quality of life of the yeah. residents. And so we're we not putting the onus on us to make sure that the quality of life. There you no, goes. right. That's yeah. it. In consideration. Yeah, of, yeah I would like yeah, yeah. In consideration okay. of the quality Perfect. of life will be yeah. included in our assessment and our recommendations to the um, mm -hmm. yeah. board commissioners. Yes, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. Well, yeah. part of what we get to sometimes when we deal with our attorneys. Um, when you start enumerating all the powers, and they'll go, well, that's not enumerated. So because it's not enumerated, mm -hmm. you have no authority over that. So to Cameron's point, the more general you can stay, mm -hmm. the more then that you're going to get caught in this trap down the road of enumeration of powers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
It is either, either listed or it's not. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that then ties to the goals that you all worked on with the City Council of which quality of life or with the advisory board, which quality of life then is one of those issues for you all in there. Mm -hmm. To Cameron's point of here's the overarching goal. And then it's really the goals and you know, it may change. You know, two years from now, we may be great on quality of life, and it may be something else that sort of supplants that because we're seeing issues. So you can think about it in that framework as well. <clears throat> Are we thinking then that the, the current last sentence, service community connectors by participating in resident engagement to ensure communication between residents and staff and the board? <clears throat> Are we thinking that covers the pathway of communication without getting too specific? <coughs> or should that stay as is? I think that sometimes is fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So maybe we add that consideration to the sentence right after that to ensure the communication? Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and draft up a sentence in the, the track changes and send it around before I post. Sure. Um, or comment. What if we put it before that in consideration of quality of life? We serve as community? Yeah. Okay. Does it, do you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Ahead of serving the community connection. Yeah, right. the, and mm -hmm. the semicolon the start, mm -hmm. you know, um, in consideration for the quality of life, mm -hmm. leave out and and serve as. Okay. okay. Or you could put that yeah. pathways of communication after you say to ensure pathways of communication. Work with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to something up and send it out to you, and then we do need to post seven days ahead at least of mm -hmm. the third. So I'll wrap that up this week, and we should be able to post. Yeah. Okay. 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 Moving on to 5B LHA Advisory Board Member Election Interview Process and Advice Interview Guide. So I was notified that I actually have to reapply for my post, <laughs> so I can't serve on the interview board. <laughs> um, so. <clears throat> Well, that, so still we have, that leaves three yeah. of us. Yeah. Cameron, you're still on. Cameron? Right? Sure. Yeah. yeah, you can. Okay. So I, I just have a question. Um, are these if we use these particular questions in our interviews, are these the same questions that the actual board is going to use when they talk to people? Because it seems kind of redundant to me that you're asking the same questions of both people. Is that the is that the case? So my understanding is that the advisory board will do this process, mm -hmm. and then you will recommend individuals right. to the council commissioners, and then they will make the selection. And they are aware of these questions, and they will take your recommendations. So I don't know that they have any questions for themselves. So there won't be is there two, two interviews? interviews? There will be. An interview and then a selection. I think it depends on how folks recommend. It, it depends their on the recommendation and some of the other pieces in this. And so okay. we're still trying to learn through this with the count with the, the council and the and, and the LHA board in terms of what they really wanted. But it was really about those that are doing the work, mm -hmm. screening folks based mm -hmm. on the work you do to ensure that we're getting the right mix and um, so it really then depends I think if they do the interviews it'll be more of a get to know you kind of approach yeah. we're mm -hmm. understanding it mm -hmm. unless the board's locked up so let's say you have a tie between who they're recommending and you mm -hmm. you can push forward one two three you can push forward everyone and I think it really gets into if there's that not that clear distinction, they may ask some of the same questions trying to help inform them, but this is really the first cut of this. And you have an opportunity to add your own question mm -hmm. as long as you're consistent across the board. Mm -hmm. Or questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Just standard hiring kind of things. Mm -hmm. You ask it to one, ask it to all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. 
sort of and to in oh, sorry no, and to ensure that these seven questions are really the right seven you would ask. Right, that's what we want to. Yeah, that's what we need to talk about today. Room. Did we make the changes that we talked about at the yes. last yes. meeting? Yes, okay. so, so the second question we requested yeah. last okay. time. So, so it's the role, what's the role of the advisory board? Right. Yeah. To the government. It'll be an interesting question since we're still sitting here trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, someone knows. Maybe they'll give us some insight. <laughs> <laughs> So a couple things I want to confirm if you're ready to make these final and then just going over schedule just so Tom and Lauren know April 25th at 5 p.m. is the, the deadline to apply. Um, then we can schedule interviews. I don't think there's any other than May. I think we're, we're open to schedule the interviews. You guys said that you wanted to do it once together. Um, I'm going to make a suggestion for you to consider that we have our next advisory board meeting May 17th. That seems like a good time if you wanted to just add on to the end of the meeting if you're all together. Um, and then the process with the with the, the LHA board, uh, that'll all be in June with the selection at the end of June. So so you're suggesting after the next advisory board that we do the interviews? I, I think it's just well-timed and you're already planning to be together, but that's really up to you if you want to set a different day. Yeah, because that would work. I, I will probably be out of town. So. I'll be to have Cameron there. Mm -hmm. We, we got to have Cameron there. I'm, I'm out the 11th to the 18th. I could do just about anything before or after. Sorry to be the difficult one. And when is, when is your turn up? Uh, Whatever the new people are June. on June. 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 Okay. Yeah. When's the deadline to get it to council? I, don't, I couldn't find that in anything yet. So far, it was just interview well, in May. So I thought. And June yeah. recommendations go in June. Mm -hmm. So they'll, yeah. So. So for a board meeting, I'm out the eighth through the eleventh. You and Cameron are going together, is that it? Well, I'm, out, I'm going first, Cameron's going, going second. <laughs> I'm getting a kid back from college that week, so. Mm -hmm. So May 8th to the 11th, and which what dates did you say? 11th to the 18th. 11th to the 18th. So uh, the first week of May is, is awful quick, um, since the applications are due just the week before. So we're looking after, between May 19th and 31st. I'm, I'm pretty open on the 20th. Mine's more for the meeting, not the interviews. Right. I'm pretty open the 20th. The 19th, I can move stuff maybe. We also, it might depend as well on how many applicants you get on how much time it needs to book. So. Right. We could circle back after the 25th and see how many there are. Isn't that a doodle poll? I can do that. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty open, you know, any time of the 19th on, so. I think from, um, they're, they're not going to do, they're going to, they're going to do this as the advisory board, not the council, right? Mm -hmm. So then, yes, they're going to do the advisory board, bring it to LHA board. Mm -hmm. Is it the LHA board that's deciding? Or is the council? It is. Well, you it's the LHA board. It's the LHA board. The LHA We're under board. the board. Yeah. Right. Because you're, they're, they're not doing it as the council, as a board. It's mm -hmm. a board. That's actually that's what why we, Lauren, that's why Lauren can, can serve because it's not the same yeah. Yeah. rules. Keep that in mind when I reply. <laughs> <laughs> because they're meeting, so that LHA Board of Commissioners, are they going to just have a, a quick session then to approve? 
Right. We, we could do it that way. We could it, you know adjourn mm -hmm. and then reconvene as LHA board for this one motion. We just need to see when they're going to do that in June. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be able to approve the special No, what we'll do is at the, the council meeting when they do board appointments, then we'll have them adjourn as a city council, convene as the LHA board, and then make this appointment and then adjourn again. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll see too. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, that's at the June meeting is canceled. So we would do a special. Yeah, okay. We do a special Limited. meeting in conjunction with the yeah. and just to, for this item. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we may mm -hmm. have a, a different need on the audit. So is it Jean that hit on the audit? Um, are they out here? Uh, we May. so May. we're that is planned for May, um, okay. but we might need a, a special meeting for that as well in late May because. May 3rd is too early for the auditors, but July is too late. Um, so we have some things to work out with Kendra. So it would be ideal if the timing works out, if we could do those together. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so circling back to the interview process and the timing. So we're kind of wait until after like 19th or 20th. For the interviews, yeah, to I'm see how many applications like yeah. before the Memorial Day. Yeah, I mean, let's tend to, how about we tentatively just say the 20th, okay. unless mm -hmm. things change, and then um, any changes to the questions, we're good with that. Anyways, yeah, okay, okay. I don't know that I could answer the questions, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll put them, we'll, we'll test them out. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go on to 5C, Revised LHA Board of Commissioners meeting calendar. So we already kind of dug into this some, so it's well timed. Um, so last meeting you requested just the, the layout of what items generally go in the year, so that's included here. But we also included a second schedule that just shows all of the advisory board meetings and all of the board meetings, just so you can see how they line up. Um, with the board meetings generally being early in the month, um, we don't actually have all of our property reports and financial reports primarily available for these meetings. So um, the last meeting we basically skipped that and the next meeting we're going to pick it up, the board meetings. So they're about six weeks there to report. That's how it pans out. So um, that will time out better for those reports. So um, we have here the general schedule that should carry forward in any year however there's a couple items in red on how we have to tweak it because of this how the dates fall so this is just a kind of an fyi unless you have any questions it's still listed on the schedule on this on this one here when you've got june so you've got june on here at aspen meadows um and i'm assuming september is canceled well, the, so this is the, for the LHA board, so right. that's for the commissioners. This that's is the board, there, yeah. but this is the advisory board, yeah, that's us. which doesn't exactly match this. Well, right. that matches that down there. So we're, we're going to, yes, that's right. So this is for the LHA this. board items. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's so you can see what's coming, and then the meeting before, or if we need to discuss any of these with you, that's how you can... And anticipate that yeah we still will have your meetings every month um there's just cancellations for the board in june and september because of conflicts they have with other things mm -hmm. um, but like we said we could if we have a, a need for a special meeting we can tack that on so in june they have like um colorado municipal league and what was the other one no um, but that would have been a board one do what? Nara would have been bold. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, this is um, for the city council. For this, for the in their council role, yeah. that we we only they only schedule two meetings in June because of that. That's why that's canceled, and we'll tag team. September is our budget session, mm -hmm. and so we didn't necessarily want to take one of those meetings, and so they're doing three meetings a month, one of which is 
the fourth meeting is a housing authority meeting, so we don't compress agendas like we were. Mm -hmm. September is a budget, and so that's one where we've said we're going to cancel it, depending on how we get real time with the budget and what they have. We may add on to some of those if we need to, or if we don't need one, we'll Welcome take to it. Next and so you can talk to me. I probably <laughs> triggered your head or two. Yeah. Um, so that's why September was canceled. And then December is similar as you in that um, we can only schedule two meetings with the way the holidays fell. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and so what we're going to do is um, really try to press. If you notice, Tuesday, May 3rd, and then July 5th, they're kind of anchoring on yeah. the backside of June pretty close so that we don't get too far behind. But if we need to, we'll add things that won't overwhelm the agenda in June. So I guess really for us, the, what we can plan on is if we do have anything for that next meeting, it's going to be the previous month's meeting. So that we can kind of plan for. Are you saying right now the audit is going to be the end of May? Probably more than likely. Right. So typically that's been done in May because the meeting, the board meeting is May third. It's so early. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Molly, we may think for the audit that may actually be conducive for a special meeting, joint meeting of both the advisory board and the housing authority board, just to go over the audit. So we're just bring the auditors in once on June twenty first. Or at the end of May. Okay. Oh, right. End of May. So, Kendra, the, cool. the auditors just started work yesterday, so she was going to check with them and make sure we take out the right timeline for when they're going to be ready. Mm -hmm. Started on the LAJ audit. On the LAJ audit. They finished yeah. the yeah. property audit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, we'll follow up with her and get that scheduled. So there are definitely going to be items that come from the Board of Commissioners that are informative, and then there'll be other items that are really seeking advice mm -hmm. and just articulating that. Mm -hmm. And the auditor one would be an inform, okay. potentially, kind of thing. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And possibly act upon if they have any findings mm -hmm. as well. And then, the, then this body would give some suggestions about that. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, Kendra's obviously not here. I think thus far, we haven't had any findings, have we? And pretty and good. The, and all the all properties, the properties. Yeah. and all the property audits, which is a change. Significant change. Awesome. Lots of improvement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's move on to number six: development in our project updates. Line with goals. So our, our biggest project with actions happening, so actively right now is Chrisman, but I want to save that for the next item because that is coming up for the board and I want to give you the more specifics on what's going to the board. So um, generally for the developments, uh, we prepared a three-year schedule of the developments, just broad categories, financing, design, construction, etc. Um, we prepared that and gave that to the board at the last meeting, April 5th. So I didn't include that in the packet, but I could share it for you. That is really to tie up, tie with our ARPA schedule for the projects that we want to move forward. Um, and just to give some expectations to the board about what the steps are and how long the steps take. So we can share that if you're interested. Um, that's kind of an overall, that's tying to that the list of ARPA projects. So the, the first two out the shoot are Christman and Sunset, which we know about. So for Sunset, we present to Chaffa next Friday the 29th, and then we should expect to hear um, by mid-May whether we are successful at the 9% tax credits. Um, so we're preparing for that presentation now. And then once that comes through, assuming it does, we will start in earnest. Um, we do have a development specialist that starts May 5th. She is a LIHTC. She has LIHTC development experience out of Great Falls, Montana. She seems wonderful. Everybody that we talked to said she was wonderful. So I'm really excited about that um, to help drive those projects forward. So do you have any questions about some of the further out projects? Do you want to go into those 
right now. Maybe you have the. I don't have the schedule in here. That I sh that could have been a bit. <laughs> but I can share it. The kind of development person is going to be like the project manager rollout for mm -hmm. each of those. And it's a little bit different mm -hmm. because we are trying to do the partnership model. So instead of having how many projects do you typically manage at a time? As a three, three. Ish. So um, it'll be more um, more of a fostering the projects along and keeping our our heavy lift is on the financing side. Mm -hmm. And if we can manage this partnership model, then the developers take most of the project management past closing. So um, in that way, where the, the idea is that she can handle more than three projects with a little bit less. Hands on, yeah. pass that Less construction management on right. site, more mm -hmm. compliance and mm -hmm. just making sure scheduling Yeah. So um, that is our idea there. We also have our HCV staff, Marcus Kennedy and Ruby Ford, are rock stars. We are caught up on vouchers and recertifications. They are both, um, they are chomping at the bit to learn and see how all the pieces come together across LHA and into the Housing and Community Investment Division. And so um, we're going to, once we get, Katie Pung is her name, the development specialist, once we get her in, um, see if we can do some shadowing, if they could help um, with any, you know, see what we it can involve them in to get more help and give them some cross-training. So that's the idea. So we should have a good team on board very soon. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, so we, we kind of get in an operational update, but when she brought up Marcus and, and Ruby, so um, I went in last week, they, they were caught up and they were already starting the next month. And um, I, I, we haven't seen that since we've been here in terms of that kind of dedication move that they're moving through it with the pace that they are. Um, and then we're just learning about other skill sets. So like Mark, Marcus, he came from South Carolina. Um, you know, he did in the HCV side, landlord relations and relationship work. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing him really kind of connect with like Susan Spalding mm -hmm. and work through some issues there. And so they're really doing a lot right now. And, um, you know, that's then freeing up Kendra on the other side to where they can really get in and manage the margins on the HCV vouchers. Mm -hmm. So if you remember, we said 420 is kind of the <coughs> we thought we needed. Mm -hmm. We've upped it by 30 in terms of vouchers that we're issuing. And that's going to let us handle the people that are porting out and in mm -hmm. um, so we can maintain a higher level. So when HUD puts a need out that we can compete more aggressively for initial dollars, but, <coughs> and then, you know, they're kind of in lockstep then with Lisa on some things. So it's interesting to see the progress that they've made in this. I mean, it really is about getting the right people and, mm -hmm. and just the volume. Marcus was interesting. He told me when I stopped by and talked to him for a while, um, his, his individual volume in South Carolina was the total volume <coughs> of all of our voucher holders here. That's kind of the levels that they would they would handle in these larger groups, and so it's a, it, it's interesting to see. But I think we're going to get some more a lot of capacity out of this. Well, that's why he took our position because he was siloed, and he wants to get out of that silo and spread. Yeah, so, so we should the our HCB staff is re this is not in development anymore, but our HCB staff is ready to ramp up our voucher program. So Kendra is just getting us prepped on the finance side to be ready to com compete with when HUD opens up, if HUD opens up a uh, notice of funding available. So. But back to development. So <clears throat> Chris and we are shooting for an April 29th closing. Mm -hmm. Probably gonna bust it. And um, probably gonna be somewhere in May 7th. Uh, I mean, I, we are routinely running into some, in the closing process, financial issues. Um, so we, we, they had about a 10% hit um, in, in cost from 
February 22nd, and then it was like at the beginning of April, raised it about a million and a half. Um, we were able to go back to DOH. Molly did a great job with NGL. They got an additional million dollars. At that point, when we worked through all the numbers, we were at about a $375,000 gap that we were trying to solve for. Um, we then had to add another $100,000 in securities um, that we thought we had solved for Friday. Um, and then MGL wants to pull early permits, which creates an additional $400,000 gap in our security process. That's merely just money there um, for securities. And so Molly sent me that email last night, and we're going to talk today to figure out how do we circle back on this and to try to figure out you know the remaining gap the challenge for us is that if it's in the lending component then it gets caught up in the waterfall and so and so the lenders have to account for every dollar going into closing what we were going to do when it was a hundred thousand dollars is we were going to do molly was going to go over this but we were going to essentially do um, a loan from the ARPA funds or the affordable housing fund to the housing authority to then pay the securities and then when the securities are released it goes back to the housing authority back to either the affordable housing fund or ARPA so that it didn't get caught in the waterfall. Additional 400000 has completely changed that so we've got to figure that out now as to how we do it. So. I mean, really, we're chasing the closing costs, the bids close. We get another bid tomorrow, tomorrow which will tell us kind of then what, what the scope of the uh, inflation increases are in construction. So fingers crossed, but it's, it's a bit of a nightmare right now trying to just get to closing. Yep. So um, some of the things that you so that, this is kind of dipping into our next item too, because I wanted to let you know specifically what's going to the board next related to Christmas. So um, timing out our schedule, uh, everyone was shooting for April 29th. We did get a chat extension and the owner allowed us to extend our purchase option for a couple of weeks. Um, so we are taking several things to city council on April 26th. The CDBG agreement to LHA, the ARPA agreement to LHA and um, well, and this the securities, which I'm gonna go over in a second. And also we have an affordable housing agreement going directly to MGL, doesn't have to go to council, but that's all timed for the 26th. And then they authorize that, then we turn around at the May 3rd LHA board meeting, have them accept all that fund and authorize the transaction to send it out to the partnership. Um, so that's all coming, we're all backing into to that to make sure that works in preparation for a May 9th close. Um, the securities, basically why that why we're in, there's two reasons we're looking at the securities. First of all, LA, uh, Longmont's development code does not allow for a waiver of securities for affordable housing projects. That's a long-term thing that we'd Maybe like to Maybe short-term now at. based on the 400K. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a more uh, you know, broad change that we would like to Proposed council, um, but the other thing is because we're getting our hopefully final construction pricing tomorrow, we know that there's going to be another million and a half of escalation, which means after the equity dips in, we're like four hundred thousand. So we're just thinking to ourselves: so we have a gap. LHA most likely is going to have to help fill it because anything that MGL fills, LHA will have to pay on the back end anyway. So. If we're looking at doing that, how come we're putting up securities that are then, uh, if not the full security, the bank fee to get the letter of credit is an actual cost in the closing. So why are we doing that when it's the city, you know, mm -hmm. who's holding it? So that was our attempt to um, help with the securities to help the overall gap come down since we would end up filling it anyway. So turns out that there's, we're, we're doing it in very short order, and um, we just have to, there's, we're over a couple of humps. The accountants are on board. The ARPA eligibility team is on board um, in terms of doing a loan from ARPA to LHA to, to cover that. And then um, we're just getting the, the public works folks 
kind of sort that out today to see what, how that early building permit affects things. Um, so I will say that the, the way that would work is the ARPA loan would come to the LHA. LHA would pay the securities directly to the city in a U shape <laughs> to pay off that on behalf of the applicant, which is MGL. Then if the securities are never called on, highly likely they would never be called on if we make it to closing, um, then the city would pay back LHA and LHA puts it back to the other piece of the city, the ARPA fund. So there is a risk because if the project does fall through after closing, then LHA is holding the bag unless LHA decides to, the board decides to do a repayment agreement with MGL. Um, honestly, we wouldn't, we wouldn't pull the loan unless we close. So, you know, that once you close, that's the real kicker, but all the other financing is guarantees the project more than our securities do. Is that tracking? That's a very yeah, it's a, it, well, it's frankly, it's something, yeah. 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 it's something that we is an impediment to affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to see that it's probably, as we get into attainable housing conversations, an impediment too, because you have to budget for the construction costs to build it. And then you have to take the securities out on top of that. And so you're just essentially putting money into a system that you're not, you know, in our case, you're not making interest on. It's just there for what if. And so this is going to turn into a larger conversation. Um, but on the front end, we think that for affordable housing projects that are LIHTC funded, DOH funded, we at least need to say you don't need securities because the security is really on that side because of the requirements they place on you. Mm -hmm. But this is a much bigger conversation that we need to have as as a on the city side of the house and it's just a it's a bit of a train wreck. And so this is a city requirement then? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we found some good things from like Fort Collins. You know, Fort Collins it's a little bit different, but Fort Collins if it's a hundred percent affordable housing, they don't require securities. Um, and so we're we're perusing different ordinances very quickly. Mm -hmm. We thought we had it solved, so we were deciding, well, it's late because it's a bigger conversation. Mm -hmm. But now that we've added 400000 to it, that's where I said we may have to speed it up again. But at the end of the day, in Crispin's case, even if we did a half a million dollar loan, circled it around, it's still a six-month proposition because of public improvements or the front end of this, and there's not a lot on this project. Mm -hmm. But the 400,000 is there is because they wanted to pull early building permits, which requires you to to, to put securities down at, I think, 130%. I call exactly. Anyway, so it's a... And that does hold out till final construction acceptance, mm -hmm. so which we're targeted to complete construction July 2023. So I just said 18 months. Yeah. Hold out. So uh, hopefully for all future projects, this is very simple. If we have a code change, they just don't pay it. You don't have to budget for it. For Christmas, it's currently on this roundabout. Basically, you'll be able to. <clears throat> so. But you can't. You can't get it involved in the, the loan because then, when you yeah. caught the waterfall, yeah. then you're like. What third or fourth and, or last, <laughs> or last, which means then you don't technically get <coughs> repaid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, because it's just caught in it. Mm -hmm. We're holding the letter of credit as a city. We release it. It goes back into the loan, but then with the way the loans are structured, then it just sits there, and you probably don't get it back until a resyndication. Mm -hmm. Which now, with um, Chapa, is twenty to twenty-five years, not mm -hmm. fifteen. Oh, so oh. that's why we were trying to keep oh. it out of that world alone. That's why the legislature just hold it and pay it more. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it just makes sense in the context of the of affordable housing to consider pulling that requirement because you've got all those other those mm -hmm. safeguards. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, the 
the novice developers, I will tell, always gripe about just the concept of security in general because you at least got to finance your project twice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I get it because if, if they stumble and the city's got to sweep in and, and finish the public improvements that they're only halfway completed, but they need the money, so it needs to come from a different source. Right. But I like the affordable housing concept. Yeah. That makes so. sense. <laughs> just don't let the greedy. Good work. Yeah, yeah we we started this yeah, one on Wednesday. Sure. <laughs> 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 and before yeah. business days, yeah. we have a code it's, change, it's a loan agreement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so yeah. so ever sure. for the project. Right. Right. Let's throw early <laughs> permits in. <laughs> yeah, you've done really good. I mean, really, I know. That's all right. It's been a well, lot to out. wrangle. Well, and that's the hard part because letters of credit used to be. What was the value of those before? Yeah, like 10%. Oh, you if, mean, if you got like a four hundred thousand dollar letter of credit, it was a percentage of the total right. value. Mm -hmm. I think everything we're hearing now, it's essentially dollar for dollar, mm -hmm. and so that's a change in the on the lending side. And so they just want that collateral somewhere, yeah. so no one's taking the risk. Mm -hmm. That point, might just get a cash to the city, right? So looking at building. Has the supply chain loosened up at all? Not at all. Yeah. Everyone says it. They think that it's going to, but mm. it's not so far. And then interest rates have gone up. Mm. Right. Yeah. Which that's what at least some of our developers are hearing. That they think that will be the trigger. It will just take some time to... Mm. Mm -hmm. It is the it is an, an um, ironic time where we have more resources than ever, but less staff capacity, although we're about to be fully staffed as of May 9th. But, um, some of us. But, well, right, I'm just saying, I'm just saying uh, the, the development side. So, um, so we have all these resources sitting here with ARPA, and it's the hardest time to build anything affordable. So. So you're still housing then? No? Affordable housing? Even though, even the mill, yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. the price, yeah. prices probably <laughs> cover that because they're so high. So is it, are we covering seven now, or did we lead into that already? That or? was that was seven. That was seven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you have any input that you'd like me to share with the board when I take that, I'll take it. All right, so let's go on to number eight. I think this is one that's always on there. Anybody have any items to add with items about part of LHA working plans or goals? I have some ideas that, um, so in my work with BCHA lately, we've been talking about um, what is our mission? What is, what do we want to put forward? We're looking at, you know, sort of revamping We've been like nose to the ground for so long and just getting stuff done. We um, we kind of want to do more. And we're also ramping up our staff um, on maintenance, operations, and development. And um, something that has just been on my mind, uh, just a few things was, um, you know, creating like a sort of housing, not a co nothing official like a coalition, but or like merging, but just a place where some of our housing folks can get together and you know t share successes failures commiserate um because you know this work is really fun but it can also be really hard um so i'm i'm just thinking about that you know we were i was thinking about it from the development side but i think it would be great to sort of have some sort of networking group or um opportunity i think bhp used to host something that bcha developers would go to pre-covid um but looking at something like that, we are all facing similar challenges um, and everywhere. You know, our residents hop from area to area, especially because we're Boulder County. You guys are in Longmont. You know, vouchers move around. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it would be kind of nice for, for that. Um, something else that we're looking at is, uh, or I shouldn't say we are not looking at it, but I am looking at this opportunity. I met with someone from Loveland Housing, and they actually created a 501c3 to do fundraising. Um, and this has triggered my, this conversation we were talking about earlier about activities. Um, you know, I think this would be a great opportunity to generate some income and money for some of these properties that 
people want to do more, but it's not an operational budget. It's not something Wine Tech can cover. Um, so if that is something that could be looked at long term, some sort of fundraising opportunity for LHA to generate money that doesn't get them in any trouble. Um, to spend money on residents to improve that quality of life and get them the things that they would like. Um, and then something else we are thinking about very intensely, which also ties in the conversation we just had, is trying to get people on board with a regional entitlement process for affordable housing in the area. Because with every single organization or every single municipality that we work with, it, we have to jump through different hoops. You know, right. Longmont has its quirks. Mm -hmm. Lafayette has its well, Lafayette has a really ancient code. Um, you know, BHP has their quirks. Come on. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Every, <laughs> City of Boulder has theirs. You know, and, no, and no. we, yeah. you know, we are not the uh, we are not the housing authority for City of Longmont or City of Boulder. Right, right. But we are for Superior and Lafayette and Louisville. Mm -hmm. But any developer, whether it's you know a housing authority or a private developer who wants to do affordable, it's so much money spent on the front end dealing with the entitlements, you know, dealing with these tap fees, water fees, all this stuff, and then having to go through um, different processes for each municipality and each group. Um, so we kind of want to start a conversation, I think, at least Molly, my cohort and I, um, want to start looking at, is it possible to get different cities and municipalities and groups on board with a, a streamlined process for affordable housing sort of like a baseline and then if you want to do some special stuff then you other things may kick in but if you're doing like straight 100 percent affordable to 60 percent ami break down some of these barriers that are stopping people from building or making it more difficult um you know because as you guys know you have to basically have a pro forma sources and uses just to apply to Chapa to hope you get money to then develop. <laughs> so it's there's a ton of work and money spent just applying for funds. So and you have to if you're not building with my tech dollars, you know, it's where you're getting your money. So um, just something to think about. I, I don't know if that's something that our our group would ever talk about, but um, you know maybe that's for a different conversation. But just things I've been thinking about in my experience in this in this um, group. Um, as part of BCHA, as a resident of Boulder County, um, just trying to break down some of these barriers to providing affordable housing because, like you said, tons of resources, mm -hmm. but it's not so easy. Um, you know, land is scarce, support is scarce, uh, money is scarce sometimes. So, so there is the policy group for the regional housing collaborative mm -hmm. that really, and Harold and Molly. Are probably going to represent us and some others. I think that there is some policy conversation yeah. with some of your suggestions so, that would be good to take forward. There is movement. So um, I'm not part of that group, so right. I get really removed from some of those conversations. So, so. the Boulder County Regional Housing Partnership um, has had a goal of doing regional administration at least for inclusionary housing. Mm -hmm. So kind of different arm, but very similar. Um, idea and actually we propose to Boulder County for their ARPA funding as the affordable housing group to stand up that program and then we figure it out going forward but and it is at the it is number two on the priority list for affordable okay. in Boulder County ARPA so they are proposing um, I think May 3rd is is when they're going to the commissioners with that so that is on the inclusionary housing side and administering um, the programs, especially for Superior and Erie and those that are that are just getting those programs started. Um, so we could at least try and model that, repair, or just use it in some way. Because inclusionary housing is what, up to 80%? It, well, it varies by jurisdiction. Yeah. And then yeah. it's only but, a percentage of the development. It's not... Right. right. But it's at least we are... There's a, there's a, there's a way in um, mm -hmm. that we could talk to that group about... Yeah, I think having something of, different that's just different, but affordable. just use that that yeah, momentum. Model. Yeah, I I think Harold has a lot of ideas about um, entitlements for affordable housing and getting at least internally at the city, getting our planning and public works staff to really understand the back end of putting an affordable project together um, to help be shepherds. And so yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm actually going to start bringing our development review team into the financing component okay. so they can understand the financial side of this. I think the win will be more be beyond just affordable housing. I think it will be attainable and just housing generally mm -hmm. because if they start understanding the, the <coughs> mechanisms you have to move through from a financial side, yeah. um, it, I think, is the best way to help them understand how they're a significant piece of the puzzle and how time mm -hmm. lag there creates significant financial pressures, whether you're for, whether you're hundred percent market rate or you're affordable, mm -hmm. it's the same pressure. And they're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna do that. The hard part about we we've kind of talked about this, so it's an interesting dynamic because so I think Longmont has the lowest water tap fees, wastewater fees. Interesting on the on the electric side, we're higher, but we're technically lower on rates because we build our capital in on the front end, which draws our ongoing rates down. That will probably never change, simply because um, everybody's in a different position um, from a utility standpoint, and and then you know. Heaven help you if you get caught in a district. <laughs> um, whether because they're even more district or different and they're outside any jurisdiction, they're on their own. Um, and then I think there's room in building codes. It's interesting right now, I think it's Louisville and Superior that are kind of fighting it. So we've adopted the new building codes. They were going to adopt the new building codes, but then the cost of reconstruction associated with the fire. Then it's well, do we keep the old codes for those that were impacted in the new? Yeah, codes? which I think they're doing. They're yeah. allowed to opt out. And so all of the there's a lot of alignment that has to occur. Um, and I think it's doable. I just think we need everyone to talk to. So the easy part is everyone aligning on the codes, absent the utilities, because it, then it's more so different. Um, so like on the electric side, obviously that's us versus Excel, United Power, or something like that. And then water, we're fortunate in that we're in a really strong position from a water perspective, unlike every other municipality. And so they will never probably be able to align with us just because of where we sit. Mm -hmm. So there will always sort of be outliers, but I think it's worth it because Definitely worth having a conversation to identify what those things that are different and can't change versus right. yeah. what we could learn from each other and could have the opportunity to change, like securities. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think relative to the 501c3 idea, I think, Kendra, we've talked about putting some stuff into the budget process and in that it, that really supports resident and tenant services. So I think she is looking at that within as LHA properties become more solvent and in the black, I think those some of those opportunities will open up within each property, hopefully, as the budget and the requirements allow. It's definitely on her radar. Yeah, so the more, this is why development is so important, and you, because the more we develop, the more we're able to spread the cost of the housing authority generally amongst mm -hmm. more properties, which then frees up the capacity within the properties to have more income available for the residents. And so, um, Crispin 2 won't hit right away, but it'll hit in five years. But then we won't only have Crispin 2, we'll have Crispin 1, mm -hmm. which then that'll be a significant uh, source of revenue. Sunset Heights will then bring, because we're going to have the operational component of that. So that'll bring revenue in. And, and so that's really why development is so incredibly important to what we do. Um, and then uh, we push back Village Place, we all talk to you about that, but which means we're pushing up the property um, on over, and then that's all connected with the dissolution of LHDC and bringing that in under LHA, which the 501c3 is an interesting idea because um, LHDC lost their CHOTO years and years ago. There really wasn't a need for a CHOTO because there wasn't a lot of money out there for CHOTOs. Well, there's now more money out there for CHOTOs. 
So we may have to consider the creation of a Chodo or somehow do it, which could tie in with the 501c3 for some of these other activities as well. So we'll need to think about that. That hit me when you said that. Yeah. And I think the existing city friends programs could also yeah. be an interim 501c3 option, which is what we've done with some of the grants we've written. So yeah. there's some options that we could pursue in the Well, we could put it into our giving campaign as a city, just like we did share the next slide and things like that. Yeah. And another model that they have that, um, look like, they call themselves LHA, which is really confusing. Loveland Housing is, um, they've actually partnered with some outside organizations right. to do, like, um, uh, what is that called? Sorry. I, I've i been sick for a week and I've got sick kids. Um, the assisted living, like we've talked about in the past for some of our residents that yeah. really aren't ready for, they can't afford regular assisted living, but they really can't be on their own either. Um, and they've they've done some some really great models so it might be something worth looking at or talking to someone there. We're on it. Oh, so no. um, <laughs> I haven't heard about that since yes. our meeting with the council a long time ago. So, so yeah. the Loveland Greenhouses mm -hmm. is actually something that they, the Hilver Greenhouse, off of, they use that model yeah, and we're looking at it. Mm -hmm. Molly um, hired someone from the Loveland Housing Authority that will start in a couple of weeks and so have they been yeah. completely vetted? Yeah. Very seriously vetted? Yep. Yeah. Because you know what they did to us before. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I'll trust you. Yeah. No, we, uh, mm -hmm. but um, they were on, they, they understood that piece of it. Mm -hmm. The other component to it is as a city, we just hired, um, and LHA is funding a portion of this, or, or is it the affordable housing fund funding it in DC? Oh, it's uh, right now the affordable, affordable. fund. So we brought in National Development Council. They do uh, affordable housing, economic development, um, basically touch every tax credit you can imagine. So they bring the expertise in um, and they partner with us on projects. Um, I've worked with them in the past. We were looking, before I left my last city, at a rent-to-own concept. Yeah. Um, they, unbeknownst to us, it wasn't something, they probably have been involved in what? Yeah. You, you said half of the affordable assisted living projects in the United States. Yeah, like the yeah. leader in. And yeah. so, I think the finance deals so we're going to bring them in and like they work with like the Cincinnati Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're bringing in technical jobs. To, we just can't. No, mm -hmm. we're, mm -hmm. and we're collectively paying $125,000 annually for a contract with them, and then they come in and they'll, you know, you know they could have an economic development project and they could work new market tax credits. Mm -hmm. um, they can move in the enterprise opportunity zone, but then they, they help yeah. you build your financial stack. Yep. Yeah. And um, so they'll be in play too. We have a lot of this. Uh, so right now we're at 1026. Yep. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, my only add-on is yeah. maybe consider a Broomfield Housing Authority and our networking, and I'm happy mm -hmm. to talk to you about setting up the networking because I want my new people in. And also I know Broomfield would be really interested. It's Kristen Heiser, mm -hmm. brand new authority. We know that the, if, if we're on board. Yeah. I say just do it and set it up. Okay, yeah. And then I can run interference with the EDs and the county executives if we need to. Okay. Right, so let's go on to number nine, that LHA report, update on Operation A, occupancy report. First up. Um, not a lot of changes here. We're still sitting at 96% occupied. Um, big thing that's coming up for the suites, we're opening their wait list for the suites in the Briarwood this week for, on the um, 21st and 22nd. Two days. Um, we'll take applications in person and via email at the LHA info build that. Um, you'll see meth units. We're working on, I think, four at the current moment. And I'll go through some updates on those as we go through the property updates. So, so one of those is from the mental health partners. Aren't they, isn't that just like short term, typically, or is that long term? Oh, sorry, the, on uh, the suites? Yes. 
So the, they do one year leases. Oh, as they well. do one year yes. leases. Okay, I thought yes. that was more of a short term. No, okay. the, okay. they okay. are on the same lease terms. They we do the leases. Okay. So MHP just provides the voucher. Okay. And we do everything else. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the presentation. Can they renew after their one year? The residents, yes. Mm -hmm. On the MHP. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any resident has the opportunity to. Okay. Mm -hmm. There, it's. The best way to say it is um, for here, MHP pays a voucher and they provide um, resources and services on site. Mm -hmm. So, but every, the leases are lease, they're Still through. through property management, they're a regular tenant. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Just with those extra services. Do they ever like not qualify for that voucher anymore? Okay. Yes. And so MHP kind of lets us know as soon as they, they don't qualify, they're given their six months to find other housing or get like back into the voucher or, or yeah some other way yeah or if circumstances change mm -hmm. re-qualify for their existing voucher okay. and we're working with mhp and aligning our resident retention process with theirs which they are also refining with doh so they'll be aligned in terms of housing retention okay any questions on the occupancy availability not much changes this month mm -hmm. So property updates, um, the next page, I've added quite a bit to add in as I didn't have a lot. <laughs> um, so some big things happening right now as um, we just became members yesterday, I got the notification to um, Boulder Area Rental Housing Association. So we'll have those resources in our pocket as well. Um, we're working on an RFP for um, a tenant landlord attorney, which has more knowledge with the ADA 504, um, fair housing, help us with the leases and re do those because it's been years since we've done those. Um, get them up to the current legislation and all those changes that were adopted in October, get all those all wrapped into our lease. Um, so uh, is this an additional attorney besides the city attorneys? It, so it, so. To employ, the city attorneys don't represent the housing authority. Okay, that I did not know, okay. We do have, yeah, authority does have its own attorneys. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. which is, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a special counsel that would be serving this need. Okay. Um, another uh, big thing we're working on that just came to light is um, we're looking to host, LHA host a fair housing training um, on behalf of multiple agencies that we work with, um, which our advisory board would be invited. The um, board of commissioners would be invited um, community and neighborhood um, resources would be invited. Um, Molly's group, HCI, would be invited because it's everybody who kind of has that intertwined working relationship with our residents, those who are facing it. I think some of the staff who intertwine don't have that knowledge or should maybe need to know a little bit more when they're working with somebody of if you do this for one, you do it for all. So we want to bring that training in house. Michelle's team, the senior services, would be invited as well. So Susan Spaulding's working with us to get that all set up, um, and I'll let you know dates. We're thinking probably this summer to host that. Um, and then I wanted to pick it back off something Molly brought up to have a um, Housing Choice Voucher Program. Marcus and Ruby are cross-training and all that. They're actually cross-training out sites as well. They're doing two half days at Village Place currently to learn that side. For the suites, um, Meth unit re remediation, it was supposed to start this week actually, and they just texted me saying that they had some cost increase and we need to look at the bid <laughs> again. Um, we finally found a company that came in and the adjusters were okay with that. We got everything signed and then they just had some cost increase. So we'll deal with that after this meeting. Mm -hmm. and, um, then we have a second contaminated meth unit here from a recent eviction. Um, they've already scrubbed the unit. We're they're doing the cleaning. We're hoping to have that unit back online by the end of the month. Luckily, that one was not a bad one. Um, it was located in one area. The testing company, the cleaning company, figured just a deep throw, chemical clean would do it, and we can get that unit back online. And they have their copy and conversation with Fire in May. Um, Ask them those seniors. Um, Molly and I were just notified earlier this week, last week. Um, Palace Construction, who did the remodel, um, is looking for volunteer projects and they are proposed to possibly doing 
um, adding access from the parking lot and walkway up into the seating areas. We have benches, but there's no ADA access to them. They're nice, they're pretty, they got rocks and concrete around them, but residents with walkers and wheelchairs can't access them. So Pals came to us saying after they heard it from a resident that they would like to possibly do this as their volunteer project for the year. Um, the neighborhood, we have um, that meth contaminated unit where had just went through final testing um, and hopefully that passes after six months. It's Was that a total gut job? Almost. We just had a, recently had to rip out the kitchen cabinets because we could not get the kitchen to pass and we had to rip out um, the duct work and the AC unit because that would not pass. The garage is completely gutted and then one utility room is completely gutted and there's a few other areas where they've had to work out drywall and insulation. They're going to grow in the concrete. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So when you look at 96% in, in just general, you see one, three, four, yeah. you know, four meth units. Um, we're actually doing a pretty good job when mm -hmm. we don't have a contamination. That really hits our occupancy. Mm -hmm. So, a long term, too. Yeah. It's not just like a, no. a month or two. Yeah. yeah. We just had a resident, uh, we were granted eviction two weeks ago for another resident who had an $8,000 balance and the judge made him go into a payment plan on court record for that one. Um, see, Briarwood, um, we had um, Monday, yesterday, a DOH inspection. Um, the units were pretty good, very minor things. Um, some of these units haven't been looked at in years because of COVID. And so the residents have done a great job of communicating their work orders. So mm -hmm. the occupied units had one had a light bulb. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then the vacant, which um, was an eviction due to a violation of the crime free lease um, was a bar in the window um, and an outlet cover. And then we, upon our inspection with DOH, we noticed one of the units didn't have a GFI in it because they were the hotel rooms converted into apartments. So Dave's working to put that in. So very minor in the units. Um, a little bit more on the property. There's some railings and stuff we have to do some work on, painting of just the common outdoor space. So we're gonna start working on getting bids on that and figure out how to do that one. Village Place, we got our coffee and conversations with Sarah, who's coming in due to, in light of a resident letting in an unwanted person or visitor. Um, and they had Irish dancers come out to their property in March. <laughs> it was one of the things they proposed to use their um, resident services budgets for, and the majority of the group agreed, and it was a nice little event on the weekend. Spring Creek, um, we're addressing a meth-contaminated unit there. It's the same situation as the one, one of the ones here where testing levels came back low. Believe that with just with the deep clean and everything that it should be done good sanitary to move back in and we'll get that one back online. And that may come up in the conversation. Yes, mm -hmm. the, we, we had to do some education. Luckily we had public safety at our coffee and conversations on the 7th and about how our processes is why everybody didn't get notified that there was a meth unit in the building because they just saw the code enforcement notice and a lot of them went into panic mode and basically let them know the levels were so low, it was contained in one little area in the unit that had no shared ventilation, no shared access, there was no reason to test the hallways and go outside of the unit. Um, Fall River had a very small turnout for their coffees and conversations. Public safety was there. Their, their thing was the towing because um, they probably had the biggest impact out of all of them. They they like it, but they don't <laughs> there. So it's a mixed review there. The ones who've been towed don't like it, but the other ones seem okay with it um, and understand the need that, the, yes, they can park closer to their building now because they have that very long parking um, area. And so a lot of them now can park closer to their building. That's not being taken up by the caregivers or visitors or the neighborhood. Heartstone, we've had, we got our audit findings for there, zero audit findings for 2021. And there were six last time in 2020. We were like 12 the time before that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's been a significant increase in like just the quality. You guys are awesome. It, it the worst to have people that, yeah. work. that work hard, <laughs> yes. yeah. care about the mission and all that. Uh -huh. yeah. 
And the lodge, same thing. They had um, zero audit findings. Um, I know Harold touched on the theft work. Of, we had an unwanted visitor get in. Mm -hmm. So we, we do have um, fire coming to their next coffee and conversations, but we're also going to touch base on, you know, what to do when you see stuff. Their residents are very active. They start about 3 o'clock and they do building patrols every night. And they, they've been shooting people out. And even a resident we noticed on the camera and heard a noise and was investigating, looking over the counter, but the guy was hiding under the counter. Oh, so scary. Yeah. <laughs> Um, open positions, we're still looking for a custodian. That has not been an easy position to fill. How many custodians do we have now? We have a contract. Um, <coughs> so we're just, how many are hiring? Just one? Just one. We have a schedule dedicated like about uh, approximately four hours per property per week. And then maintenance will start picking up some of the slack as we're okay. bringing on new maintenance guys and retraining mm -hmm. the two that have been here. They're they're getting into the routine of going around, checking the dog stations in the morning, doing a quick trash pickup. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is helping having landscaping. Um, this morning I drove in and I've never seen the suites parking lot look so nice. Our landscaping contract started on the 16th and they did a full cleanup of the whole property. So we did have a maintenance tech can, um, do a conditional offer acceptance on Friday. He comes with the same, not the same, but similar skill sets to Dave, our new Dave was promoted to maintenance supervisor yesterday, so it's not even on here. Um, but we hired or made the offer to a gentleman who has a lot of the same skill sets, the same knowledge, the same certifications, which makes our jobs easier, our need for vendors a lot less. Mm -hmm. We're being able to take care of stuff in-house and not have to pay for the little things. Mm -hmm. um, we're recruiting for an assistant manager for Aspen Meadows Senior and Neighborhood, um, Aaron gave us a short notice and has moved on. So in the interim, me and Andrea are filling in half days at the property, which for me has been amazing. I got to have coffee <laughs> last week with the residents and it's been quite enjoyable getting to know the residents at a deeper level. And then we're going to be recruiting for a manager for Village Place Apartments. Um, the manager, Adam, has accepted the position under Molly. Someone mm -hmm. poached our man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is where we should get yeah, a guy in the He has solid. What are you doing? His background is CDBG and rehab. Yeah, uh, this is exactly yeah. in line yeah. with yeah. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good news. So, yeah, at least we kept them somewhat in that office. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So the residents are requesting at least one coffee a month that he needs to show up. <laughs> That's a good sign that they yeah. are. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got it. We had a welfare check there last night, and I, I was there at about 11.30 with the residents, and um, that's what I got. They're like, they're like, we're happy for him, but we're mad at you. <laughs> and I'm like, sorry. They're like, you told us you would get a good one, and you got a great one, and now you're taking them from us. I was like, you'll see him. He'll, he'll be involved with the resyndication. You know, you'll, you'll see his face. You stop by the city, pay your utility bill. Come see him. Yeah, I mean, if you hired somebody, really good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will. I'm going to pick up for Kendra. She's in with the auditors today, so I'm reading her update. So, pardon me for the for just sounding like that. Okay, so the, all the our property audits are completed and final to being drafted. The LHDC audit is nearing completion, and LHA auditors started yesterday. They're in house this whole week. Accounts receivable is looking fairly decent with the exception of the neighborhood. That property has the meth unit, but they're over 30000 in costs. There are approximately five tenants that are in stages of getting additional rental assistance, and we know that three have been approved thus far. One was finalized in court with the required payment plan. So, um, we are two months into the financials. The only budget issue currently in play is snow removal. We budgeted for 11 poles at various inch accumulations, and we have had 15 different snow events since January 1st. For some properties, we are over budget, and others, uh, one more event will exceed the budget. So, I'm just going to pause there. We have to sort, we, you know, we haven't had snow now for several weeks, but we also have to plan for the fall and, and, mm -hmm. and 2022. Mm -hmm. So, we have to do some work to see what we can do there. Um, you have a new voucher report at the very back of your packet. Um, we're going to be including this on a monthly basis. So this is updated as of April 1st. Um, we have 400 vouchers paid to various landlords. 
Six tenants are currently in the process of porting out. Tenants that port out are still a responsibility until absorbed by their next housing authority. 18 vouchers have been issued. These tenants are in stages of finding a place to live. 20 additional vouchers have been released to stay ahead of the game and enable the housing authority to voucher up more quickly when we have ends of participation, etc. Mm -hmm. And we have one tenant with a scheduled briefing that's, that's, that's the only one we got there. So this is something we're gonna keep updated. This helps us yeah. track um, and be able to convey a very complex process more simply. Good job, Kendra. Yeah, thank you, Kendra, <laughs> for typing that out for me. Sorry. <laughs> so is this gonna be just added on? You'll have the months going down? Yeah. Is that how um, it's you know, I think it's just one. one. I think it was just like, like update. Update. No, this time just one. Just okay, yeah, okay. This is what it'll look like for. Maybe kind of include how I do on the occupancy, the one three four, you know, so we can That's see the trend to see the change. Yeah, right. yeah. It's a great idea. Yeah, it's a really good idea. And the port in vouchers, um, other housing authority vouchers, we're not necessarily fully porting them in because then that would come off the top of us versus if they're here and we're servicing them, then we get the admin fees from those vouchers <coughs> coming into us. So we're not actively pulling them into our system. Yeah. What number of vouchers would you would be your goal out here that you would really like to see? Um, well, it's really a dollar amount. So I think that's what we spent some time with the LHA board on is it's it's the amount of money that we get that we need to increase because mm -hmm. we've just been stagnant. And so then based on rental increases and, and just the numbers, that's what we're managing because we also have to have um, um, savings or we have to hold so much money for increases so we, we can afford to pay everyone's voucher. So that's that's what we're managing is what we're having to have as a fund balance in here versus what we're putting out, knowing that we're constantly losing people. So um, kind of the model we built off of is how we over hire for certain positions, knowing that there's gonna be turnover. And um, so the big piece is, it, it's more of, it would be really good if we could add a, a million dollars, you know, into what we have in our voucher bucket, but you can't apply for that money until you can show that you're spending that money and digging into your reserves. Yeah. Right. So it's it's a pretty delicate balance. Yeah. Uh, going on, uh, B, update from ED. Anything else? Yeah, you got it. No. <laughs> 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 Ten, other business? I just have a question. Yeah. Because the Denver Post has been doing this thing about what if the uh, government funds been spent on for this relief. And so I'm just kind of assuming that Longmont looks really good in Colorado and is st stand out as far as the funds that have come through during this COVID time. Uh, are you talking about the ARPA funds or the CD funds? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we have, you know, on the ARPA funds we put... Uh, 8.9 million in for affordable. So we had 12.9 million, 8.9 or so of that went in to affordable. We're bringing 3 million over from our affordable housing fund. So we're putting almost 12 million dedicated to affordable housing. Um, part of that was the purchase of the nine acres of the property associated with Costco. Another part of it is purchasing the old Royal Mobile Home property from our stormwater fund for affordable housing, Christmas two at 800,000. Um, the rest, we're waiting to see what happens. So on Sunset Heights, if we get the 9%, I think we put 1.5 million in for that one. If we get the 9%, we're probably not gonna need all of it, you know, based on where we are in design right now, because we're just gonna start if they get the 9%. If they don't get the 9%, we'll use that to bridge the 9% gap so that we can continue moving forward on it. If we don't, we're looking at partner potentially partnering with um, the Recovery Cafe to bring them on site to provide substance abuse um, sort of programs for individuals here. And then ideally, if we can do something like that, then how do we, once we bring those units online, how do we create, um, how do we potentially create a substance-free floor? So we're finding that that's a big need. And so there's 
mixes when we use it. So, I mean, we're drawing down on it um, as we speak, but we have five years. Until 2026. Yeah. So four years to spend it. Were you talking about the, the article about fraud and mm -hmm. COVID money? Mm -hmm. okay. That, and then the, where they've gone back and started checking to see where's the money actually been spent. So I'm thinking that we are going to be sort of the, per, the, the city that shines in Colorado as far as we've done it right. I hope so. I mean, you know, our first run at this was with um, the um, DR recovery funds and we're using the same process. And um, we haven't had a single call back on disaster recovery funds related to the flood. Mm -hmm. um, and Molly really led that initiative. Um, with Kathy and Peter Gibbons and others, and so both from the FEMA side and the DR side, um, we haven't had any callbacks, and we're using the same model. Yes, so we're right. taking the um, uh, safe harbor approach, so affordable housing is a safe harbor approach, um, qualified census tracts is a safe harbor approach, um, and so that's really guiding us to, the, to that point of not getting caught in it, because um, we've seen some of our other local groups get caught in it and it was a nightmare for them and then for Molly to untangle and help fund projects. So we had a head start understanding the risks of eligibility and that type of thing and, and implemented that in very short order which other communities didn't have that much practice under their belt and it was a lot harder to put it out that fast and do it right. So, so you guys have haven't been audited yeah. but if we do we're ready. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are good. Uh, we'll adjourn at 10.50 uh, next week, May 17th.